You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 86, the story of my conversion to the Catholic Church. Howdy, and thank you for listening to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. Today's podcast is a little bit different. It's an interview format with my buddy, Matt Leonard, Matthew Leonard, and we talk about my conversion to the Catholic Church and some other random tidbits. Magic, Magic Mike, let's get to the show. Everybody, I'm here with uh, Taylor Marshall and Dr. Taylor Marshall, I should call him, the president and founder of the new St. Thomas Institute. And uh, we're here in Steubenville, Ohio right now. We both were speaking at the Applied Biblical Studies Conference at Franciscan University. And uh, since Taylor and I are buddies, we go way back. I said, hey, let's go jump in the studio and and we can chat and uh, just share uh, with each other and you guys what's kind of going on in our lives. And uh, for those of you who have not heard of Taylor... I don't know what rock you've been under, but uh, he's the author of a bunch of different books. And uh, one of them is The Crucified Rabbi, Judaism and the Origins of Catholic Christianity. He's got a nonfiction one, too, Sword and Serpent. You can find that on my Fiction. Favorite. Excuse me, I say nonfiction? Fiction, sorry. Fiction. Sword and <laughs> Serpent. <laughs> yep. And that's up on Amazon, right? It's an e-book. Uh, no, you can, get the, you can get the print version, yeah. You can get the print version yeah. there, too? Mm-hmm. That's awesome, dude. What else? What, are you working on any new books right now? Um, I'm all, we're always working on books, right? Yeah, you're always working. Right. You always got outlines and notes and books. So, yeah, I, I one on Our Lady, working on the sequel to Sword and Serpent. And uh, first of all, it's great to be on the show. Oh, well, thanks. Um, and, um, yeah, probably another 50 pages book. I've been doing kind of this series of 50 pages. Yeah. Thomas Aquinas in 50 pages. Augustine, Augustine in 50 pages. Right. And I'm, I've, I think I've got another church figure that I want to do 50 pages on, but I'm not ready to announce it yet. Okay. Super secret. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, where would people find those 50 pages books that exist? Amazon. Right now? Go to amazon.com. Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Thomas Aquinas 50 pages, Augustine 50 pages, or I'm giving away Thomas Aquinas 50 pages for free ebook. Just go to taylormarshall.com. Hit it for free. It's a great website. I go there quite often as a matter of fact. So check it out. Yeah, Taylor, um, so you're the president and founder of this online uh, kind of uh, an institute, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. But for those people who don't know much about you, give us a little bit of your background because you have a really unique conversion story, and we're both converts, so I love to talk to converts. So you tell us where you're from and, and what you're about. Born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas. Woo-hoo! I'm a native. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Texas, yeah. yep. Um, still live there. Love it. I've been all over, lived everywhere, but I'm back there because I love it so much. Um, I'm so jealous, man. You should move there. Oh, it's incredible. My, where my heart is. The politics are better, right? The church is better. Totally. The economy is better. <laughs> Everything. Everybody food, listening, you right. should move to Texas. You should move. And if you're if you're conservative and hardworking, move to Texas. Amen. So, uh, it's a wonderful place. I grew up in a home that was nominally Christian. We never went to church together as a family. Um, in my childhood, I had a Lutheran best friend who told me I was going to go to hell because I wasn't baptized. Could have been me. I don't know. <laughs> Were you Lutheran? No. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was, con- I was concerned about spiritual things because I had a destiny for hell, and that concerned me even as a child. And I was a big baseball fan, Texas Rangers. Amen. And my father, he, he invented the best way to dry pepperoni. Wow. He has a Ph.D. in meat science. <laughs> Where do you get a Ph.D. in meat science? Texas A&M, my alma mater. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so he did this in the early 80s, and it was great because this is when delivery pizzas were coming online. I know. It's... Yeah, and his one of his biggest customers was Tom Monahan, yep. Domino's Pizza, Pizza Hut, Little Caesars, all these. And so he was selling pepperoni and pizza toppings and to all these you know pizza companies. And he was up in Detroit with Monahan, and they were at a baseball game. Because at that time, Monahan owned the Detroit Tigers. Right. And they were at a Detroit Tigers game. They were playing the Texas Rangers in Detroit. And Monahan got all the autographs of the Texas Rangers and gave them to my dad as like a business gift. Like, hey, you know, thanks for coming up. You know, oh. thanks for the deal. I don't know if they did a deal that weekend or what, you know. 
and he gave him the the autographs. And so when he got home on the business trip, he gave it to me, his oldest son, and I was thrilled to have all the autographs of all my heroes on the Texas Rangers, even though back then they were the Rangers terrible. were awful. <laughs> they were bad. But I was a little kid, and I loved them, <laughs> you know? Me too. <laughs> so one of the Rangers was Daryl Porter. I remember and, him. Yeah. You remember him? Yeah. Catcher. Yep. And he wrote under his signature, Romans 10, 9, which says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And I thought, I can be saved by just believing in Jesus and believing that he rose from the dead. I'm not even sure I knew what exactly all that meant. But I found a Bible. I looked it up. I read that verse. And it was a, re- it was a relief to me because I— now that I'm Catholic, I would say I was relieved to know that I could be saved in a non-sacramental way because <laughs> because my Lutheran friend had told me that I wasn't baptized, so I couldn't be saved. But here was this offer of faith, right, in order to be saved. So that was really the beginning of my Catholic journey. And as I began to grow, I began to read the Bible cover to cover as a teenager, um, had a deep conversion, really began to love Christ and started to have this call to be a pastor, to be a minister. But I needed to find which denomination was the right one. That was going to be my question. Yeah. So that that started this journey of which is the best or the only true expression of Christianity on earth. And all the way through college, you know, I I dabbled in Calvinism. I was, you know, read a lot of Luther. I read a lot of John Calvin. Um, But from reading Calvin, I got introduced to Augustine. I started reading Church Fathers. And I began to see in the early church, the guys following the apostles— they were interested in the Eucharist and apostolic succession and priesthood and all of these things that seem somewhat foreign to me as having come through an evangelical, reformed, Calvinistic route. So I made a bad decision at that time, but it was, I guess, the best one I knew, and I became Episcopalian. Because as an Episcopalian, you can still take some of the reformed Protestant quote, advantages, but still have all the semblances of being Catholic, like priesthood, apostolic succession. We as Catholics know that the Anglican apostolic succession was broken and Anglican orders are null and valid, but I didn't know that at the time. How old were you about this time? This is uh, like I'm a senior in college. Okay, uh, I just met my wife. She was going to a kind of liturgical Presbyterian church. Uh, she, then she started going to an Episcopal church as well. Um, and on our first date, she was like, you know, she was talking about the Eucharist on our second date, she was talking about apostolic succession and she was very attractive. So I was like, I think I'm going to marry this woman. (laughs) You know, I was going off to seminary, you know, the next fall. And I was like, aha, this is my wife. So we fell in love and, and we began the journey. I was eventually ordained an Episcopalian priest, uh, but was really kind of struggling with the Roman question by then having read John Paul II and Catholic literature, read some Ratzinger by that time, started feeling the tug and the draw. So Joe and I went to Rome, and we ended up going to Mass with Pope Benedict and meeting some amazing people and some cardinals and just knew that the Holy Spirit was calling us to be Catholic. So you went went to Rome as an an Episcopalian? Yes. Wow. Wow. To visit, and I, I mean, I was walking around in a Roman collar and a black suit, right? You know, <laughs> anyone ask you for confession? No one did. Well, the reason that no one asked me is because a wife, because I was walking around with this like beautiful blonde woman <laughs> who was pregnant, scandal, who has like a baby bump, <laughs> and all the nuns are looking at like, who's that priest <laughs> with the pretty blonde lady who's pregnant? Like, are oh, they in man. Rome for <laughs> <laughs> absolution? Yeah, like the reserved sins to the Holy See or something. So, I don't. I, It's funny, going to Rome, I didn't think that would be a problem, but after I'd been to Rome a little bit, I was like, hmm, this is a little bit awkward. Right. Because the the Mass we went to with Pope Benedict was February 2nd, Feast of the Presentation, Purification. In that Mass, all the tickets had been given to religious and heads of orders. In fact, Andrew Apostle was there that night. I met him that that night. And so everyone there was in habit, except for me and my collar and my pregnant wife. And we got a lot of Stairs from nuns. I'm sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So when you stairs were, of derision. When you yeah. were there, I mean, you said you felt the tug, right? And, and what what was that like? I mean, what? A- so I can explain it exactly. I rem- I was standing in St. Peter's. For those of you who've been to St. Peter's, near the statu- the bronze statue of St. Peter. Everybody mm-hmm. rubs the foot, you know. Yep. But a little bit, maybe five ten feet back from there, and Pope Benedict was on the altar, 
And it was an evening liturgy. It was dark outside. It was dark in St. Peter's. Everyone had candles. And Pope Benedict celebrated the Mass. He consecrated. I was extremely moved by it. It came time for communion. Everyone started going forward, and I knew that I was not a Catholic. I knew that I could not receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church. That just killed me. I always describe it as this in my guts, like this disordered, spiritual, hollow feeling. And I knew, people are often amazed when I say this, but I knew in that moment that I was in schism, I was in heresy, I was not implanted into the one true church. I was not in full communion with the body of Christ. And I knew that if I continued in that state, I would be damned. I would go to hell because I knew the truth. Wow. In this moment, and it says in the catechism, if you know that the Catholic Church is the true church and you don't enter it or remain in it, you can't be saved, right? I mean, if you have the fullness and you reject it, that's serious. Yeah, you're acting against your conscience. Exactly. And in that moment, I knew I had crossed over that line in my conscience. I knew the truth. And if I didn't act on it, I would not be, I would not be going to heaven. I, I was out. So when the Mass was over, I was just in this kind of spiritual frenzy. And I walked, I heard an American priest talking. I walked up and I was like, hey, I'm an Episcopalian priest and I want to become Catholic. And he just kind of looked at me like, you're weird, you know? <laughs> so, and like walked off. <laughs> And so then I was really kind of like, whoa, you know, what am I going to do now? And then I saw a priest in a, in a habit, a gray habit, and I had seen uh, Father Benedict Rochelle on TV the man. before. So I was like, oh, that's that guy. He had a beard. Yeah. So I went over, and I was like, Father Benedict, you know, and he turned around. It was a different guy, and it was Andrew Apostoli. <laughs> they, look all, they all look alike. Yeah, <laughs> right. Gray beard. And so Jedi, I was like, hippie. Exactly. Yeah. And so I said, you know, Father, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian priest, and I just at Mass with the Pope, and I realize that, you know, I'm outside the church. I need to become a Catholic. I need to convert. And he's like, slow down, slow down. And he's like, here's a Fulton Sheen prayer card. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Okay. And Is this it? We just, we just stood out on the steps in front of St. Peter's and talked for, I don't know how long it was, 10, 15 minutes. He, he calmed me down. He says, where are you from? I said, Fort Worth, Texas. He said, oh, Bishop Van is the new bishop there. And I said, yeah, I've actually met him before. It He came over to our Episcopal Parish once. And uh, he's okay, when you get back, you need to go and meet with Bishop Van and just tell him everything, and he'll help you. So Joy and I had a, a wonderful time in Rome. We knew that that was the course at that point. There's no going back. So she was totally on board with you. Yeah, we were, we were lockstep. I mean, That's we talked awesome. about ever since— our marriage is, has great communication. We talk about the spiritual stuff all the time. So always she knew where I was and I knew where she was as we were moving down this journey. And we kind of agreed to go to Rome to just sort of get a feel like, you know, is this something we should do in our marriage and with our family or not? Let's just go to Rome. It was our fifth anniversary. We thought we were going to go to Venice, but we said, well, we'll do it more spiritual. We'll go to Rome. And, you know, that, what was it, the next day or maybe later, some, somewhere around there, I met Monsignor James Conley, who's now Bishop Conley. And he really wrestled with me theologically on Anglican orders. Are Anglican orders valid? Are you a real priest or are you not? Are you a layman in a collar? You know, that kind of conversation, which was very uncomfortable. I'll bet. But he opened a lot of doors for me as well, both in Rome and then throughout the years. He's really been helpful. So that's kind of the—and when I got home, I met with Bishop Van and— yeah, you, If I remember correctly, though, you, you told me this uh, a few years ago. You, like, called him up. You're like, I'm, I'm coming over, something like that. It was a pretty rapid meeting, right? Yeah, so as soon—the day I got home from Rome, I wrote a letter. Okay. And I went to his rectory, the bishop's rectory, and knocked on the door because I figured right. if you want to talk to a bishop, you just go to his house. <laughs> so I went there, and a priest came to the door. Uh, he was an Indian priest. I said, may I please talk to the bishop? And he said, well, he's not in town right now. And I said, okay, when does he get in town? He said, I think it was like five days. And I was like, oh, my, five days? I can't wait five days to become Catholic. I got to become Catholic like tonight, you know? That's how I was thinking, you know? <laughs> I was like so charged up. And so I said, well, will you please give him this letter? He said, well, actually, he's going to be in like two days. He's going to come back in town, spend the night, and then he gets on a plane and he leaves again. So when he comes in during his little gap, I'll give it to him. So two nights later, my phone rings, and it's Bishop Van. He's like, hey, I just got in from the airport. The priest gave me your letter, come down to the rectory right now. And my Episcopalian parish was like a block from his, the Catholic cathedral where he lived. 
So I went down there and I went into his parlor and I just told him everything that happened in Rome. And I said, I need to become Catholic. I want to receive the Eucharist in communion with Pope Benedict. And I was like crying at this point. Like, this is the pearl of great price. I'm ready to give up my salary, my medical insurance, you know, pension, everything, my vocation, right? Right. To become Catholic. So he helped me and, and we prayed and eventually um, I prayed a novena to St. Jude. On the ninth day, I was offered a position as assistant director in Washington, D.C. at the Catholic Information Center. And while I was at the Catholic Information Center, I was in charge of lining up speakers and events. And so I got to meet kind of the whole who's who of American Catholicism. And that's where I got to know Scott Hahn and I got to know some, you know, several bishops and I started writing for some bishops and was just organizing all these book signings and speaking events and also doing speaking there in D.C. at the Catholic Information Center. So that kind of was like a splash. You know, I just kind of baptized by fire into everything kind of going on in the Catholic Church in the United States. Went to the USCCB conference and just did a bunch of things in that first year. What took you um, from Catholic, Catholic Information Center, I mean, fast forward to now? And, you know, tell, tell everybody what you're doing right now with the New St. Thomas Institute. Okay, so I, I've always been academic. I'm always writing. I'm always teaching. And my wife always said, you know, you should just go. Back when I was an Episcopalian priest, you should go get a doctorate. You know, and I, I was actually going to get a doctorate while I was serving as, you know, a minister, clergyman. But I put it off. Because, you know, once, you, once you're once you doing ministry, there's never the right time. Correct. So I I had been accepted to the um, University of Dallas's doctoral program with stipend and full tuition and everything. And I asked them for two years delay because I wanted I was a, I told them I'd just become a Catholic and I was figuring things out. So I was I knew I was accepted there and I was looking at other departments. And actually, it was Scott Hahn. He was at the Catholic Information Center and um we just spent the whole afternoon. We just hit it off. And he said, you know, you." he's like, you've played six innings. You need to play nine innings. Finish the game. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, get your doctorate. Just get it. Do it. You know, don't waste any more time. And so after that meeting with, with Scott Hahn, I was like, okay, I'm going to quit here at the Catholic Information Center. I'm going to go back to Texas because we wanted to go back to Texas anyhow. Like I said at the beginning of the show, it's, right? It's Texas. The best, yeah. It's the best nation on earth. <laughs> Sam Houston was my first yeah. president. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so we went back to we went back to Texas, and I, I'm always forever grateful to Scott Hahn for that because he just he just pushed me and said, "You got to just go get the doctorate. You know, you're gonna keep having more kids. You're gonna get older. You know, like it's never a good time. Now is the time. Just do it." And it's kind of cool he used the baseball analogy too. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, you know, I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Baseball and spirituality going hand to hand in there this whole go. thing. Oh yeah. American pastime. Exactly. So I went back to the University of Dallas. I, I did my PhD and in, I think it was four years. My dissertation was St. Thomas Aquinas on natural law and the twofold beatitude of humanity. So it's natural law. It's, it's, um, it has to do with human ends, whether humans have one end, supernatural, heaven, or two, a natural happiness as well, and how those relate to one another. It's a very controversial topic in the last hundred years, especially after Vatican II. What what drove you to Thomas to begin with? When I was a, a when I was at Texas A and M as like a freshman or a sophomore, I took a medieval philosophy class. I was a medieval, or I was a philosophy major. But I took a medieval philosophy class, and we read Thomas there. And even though I was a Protestant, we read we read so much junk in the philosophy department. But I remember reading Thomas Aquinas, being like, "This guy's good." You know, he's before the Reformation. I knew that, <laughs> so I couldn't blame him too much. But he was very clear, and I liked him, and I was attracted to him. And so even, you know, all the way through seminary and graduate school, I was always drawn to Thomas. And, and to this day, I mean, he's my hero. I love St. Thomas Aquinas. Ask his prayers every night. Um, and so, you know, working in academia, working at some colleges, eventually I heard over the years, because I write books, I podcast, I speak all over the country. I hear from people saying, I want to study theology. I want to study Catholic theology. I want to study Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, and I want to go through Romans and all these things. Where should I go, Dr. Marshall? What do I do? And I always said, well, you know, you go to Steubenville. You could go to, um, you know, Ave Maria. You go to TA, you know, you go to these programs. Maybe you go to CUA. And they would always say, like, well, you know, I don't want to quit my job or I'm a mom. 
or I'm retired and my grandkids are in this town. And so I realized there's this zeal and this desire for hundreds of people who want to study Catholic theology, but the traditional means for doing it doesn't work. So in a, in a previous position, I had been overseeing some online courses. And I thought, well, what if I just reinvented or reimagined what education is? Like instead of having like really long courses and semesters and papers and all that, what if it was very like brief and if it was all customized for the lawyer or the mom who's just going to take classes while she's nursing a baby or the retired person who's picking up kids from school um, or a college student? Or a seminarian who is going to seminary and maybe some of his classes aren't totally legit or he's not really happy or he wishes he could go deeper. Here is an opportunity for him once or several times a week to take some classes and to study and to get resources. So in 2013, we launched the New St. Thomas Institute. I was very nervous about it. I'd spent six months and everything I had building it up. And when we launched it on the Feast of the Rosary, it just sold out, filled up, enrolled immediately within the first day or two. And I was, I was blown away. And, con- and since then, it just continues to grow. We actually keep it from growing because there's, there's so many people. There's a waiting list to get in. And it's, it's extremely popular because there are so many hundreds and thousands of Catholics. They want to study Catholic theology in a deep way, in an academic way, but not in the way that they get it at a local seminary or college. And so we kind of have this this niche, this kind of exclusive way of delivering content. And as long as you have an iPad or a smartphone or a laptop or a computer, or some people even do it through their, their Roku on their TV, you know, they sit on the couch. Uh, if you have that, you can study with us. And we are, ex- we're extremely cheap. So like a class at a university would cost like $2,000 or a whole semester would be like $20,000. You know, we are like anywhere. If you just want to do basic, you know, it's like 29 a month. You can quit anytime. There's no semester obligations or anything like that. Uh, and we can we now offer certificates, so you can you can get a Catholic certificate in theology, philosophy, where we really hone in on Thomas Aquinas, and uh, apologetics. We just launched apologetics this year, and I think I don't even think I've announced this yet, but I think next year we're going to be doing church history. We'll do a whole certificate on church history. And what's the website for that? NewStThomas.com. And the, I, I will the say, institute's called the New St. Thomas Institute, and the website is newstthomas.com. I think one of the coolest things about it, because I've watched some of your videos, and I was actually a member for a while, and uh, you do deal with, with uh, topics in an in-depth way, and it's academic in a sense, but at the same time, don't be afraid of that word, because right. the way that you present it, and I think this is a, a great talent you have, is that you break it down into really understandable terms, so the layman can actually learn some of the deeper things and maybe graduate up to kind of an intellectual middle class ground. And that's our goal, right? We're not we're not going to make you into a PhD. Right. But like let's say just for example trinitarian heresies. We know you're busy. So we're going to give you the like 10 most popular evil trinitarian heresies in the history of the church and we're going to do it in 15 minutes. And then we're going to give you a bunch of resources if you want to go deeper. So you can spend 15 minutes and get just bullet point, you know, here's this heresy and here's what it taught and here's why it's wrong. Here's how the Catholic Church refuted it. Here's this heresy. Here's what they taught. Here's why it's wrong. Here's the Catholic Church. And it's just 15 minutes. And normally if I were going to do that at a university in an academic setting, I would probably spend a couple weeks on it, maybe a full week on it and lecture several hours. But I realize that if you're a young mom, you know, let's say you're 29, you have three or four kids. You've been out of college for a while, and I and mom says all the time, you know, I don't talk to any adults all day. I feel like, you know, my, my mind is not stimulated. I want to learn. I want to study. But I'm a mom. Like, I'm not going to drive down to the university and take a class at night. There's no way, right? So this is a great way. Like women, like they say, I get my iPad out, I nurse my child, and I take and I watch a class. So how does it work uh, pragmatically? So what is it, like a new video every week that comes out, and there are forums that people can join in on the website? Yep. Um, every Tuesday is what we call Thomas Tuesday, and a new new content comes out every week, video, audio, notes. And uh, also, th- we recently just added uh, quizzes at, at the end of each module that kind of show you how you're retaining the information. There is a final exam, which is optional. That's a, that's a pass-fail. <laughs> but the quizzes kind of along the way let you know, like, are you retaining it? And, and people, it's, it's good. You know, it helped. We didn't originally have that, but the, but the members really like that because it kind of 
it keeps them accountable, but it's not like a, a sharp accountability that they get penalized for. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's small groups, there's forums there. You can watch a video and ask a question. And then I come in and answer your question. And then once a month, we have a lot of kind of deep, hard questions that I can't just, you know, quickly answer. And so we have what's called the ox talk after Thomas Aquinas. He's the dumb ox. Um, we have the ox talk and I go once a month and I pick one or two, maybe three of the really hard questions that were asked in the new St. Thomas Institute on some of the content we've covered. And I sit down, I got a mic like this and I do an audio recording, usually about around an hour where I kind of get down into some of the texts, whether they're church texts, magisterial texts or scripture or whatever, and, and try to answer those really tough ones. Yeah, no, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, too, and I think they're a great resource for people who are looking to some you know, some deep answers. And again, just like your videos, I think the talent you have is breaking this down for the layman so that, and this is the other thing I like about it, it's not just about learning, right? It's about transformation of the person because that knowledge leads to a greater love of the Lord, and then you're actually able to engage other people in yes. a deeper way. And I'm assuming that's part of you know what it is you guys are after. Exactly. I mean, we're, we're about faith and works. And I always right. try to stress that to the members. You know, Thomas Aquinas was an amazing theologian, but he was a mystic. I mean, the guy elevated. When he didn't know the answer to a problem, he would go into the church and put his head on the tabernacle. Ugh. You know, I mean, this guy was an incredible, holy mystic. And that's that's what we're supposed to do with theology. We're supposed to learn theology and then take it into the world. Another thing we do at New St. Thomas is, is a portion of all the tuition we support, help support a orphanage in China for, for children who have been thrown away, literally thrown away. And then we also feed, I don't know what the numbers are lately, but we, we donate and we feed about, I think it's two or 3,000 a month as well through, through the new St. Thomas Institute. Because we, we just want, it, we want our members to know it's not just about books and intellectualism because that can lead to pride. Right. What we also do is help the widow, you know, benefit the orphan, feed the hungry, like that is theology. That is a theological outcome of studying truth. You're so Catholic, man. Faith and works. <laughs> Faith and works. Out loud. Yeah. Well, um, what what uh, orphanage are you guys donating to in China? It's um, Little Flower. Yeah, I used to donate to the same They're place. They're great. They're wonderful. For years. They're in, wonderful. In fact, one of the first girls when I was coming into the church, I had not yet become Catholic, and I mm-hmm. came in here at Franciscan. And one of the very first girls that I met here became a good friend of mine named Shannon Walsh, and she directed that place. I know her name. I've never met her. Yeah. Yeah. No, when I met this girl, she was sleeping on her floor practicing to become a missionary charity or something like that. Unbelievable. No, it's a great apostolate. It's a great – I mean, these these children – I mean, I was – a priest was telling me about what really moved my heart for – and I wanted New St. Thomas to start supporting them. As he told the story of this young man, uh, the women there found him in a field – Wow. An infant covered in ants and mosquitoes. <sighs> Brand new baby. And he had claw hands and claw feet. And they wrapped him up and they nursed him back. And now he's, I think he's a teenager. I can't remember his name right now. You see him sometime on the, on the website. Wow. And he was telling the priest, he like got up to give a testimony. He was talking to a group. And he's like, I'm so happy to be alive. When I was born, my parents didn't love me and didn't want me. So they put me in a field. But the, the women found me, and they brought me here, and now I have all these friends, and I know Jesus, and I have a wonderful life. And, I mean, that just cut me to the heart. Like, the stuff I complain about in my life as a American who lives in the top, what, I don't know, 1% or 2% of the people on all earth. Like, right. my so-called first world problems, like I can't get a good internet signal at Starbucks. Right. Or what You know, like the stupid stuff <laughs> that stresses me out. I mean, here's a young man in China who was completely abandoned. You know, and he has physical deformities and didn't receive any love, and he is joyful, and he knows Christ. So I was like, "These, whatever they're doing over there, that's awesome. Like, we need to support those people at the news. We, I, want, I want the New St. Thomas Institute to support those people because that's, like, gospel ministry. Yeah, and if you don't have that understanding of, of being incorporated into some kind of a familial unit that loves you. Exactly. And how can you relate to God? It, it, it it's it's so hard. I mean, this is a young man who was a completely abandoned, right? But it shows that the in through grace and the power of the gospel, even people who have been totally abandoned by their biological family can be rescued and healed and nourished in Christ. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. That's yeah, because it's, it's like of the Holy Spirit. It's like what you read in the Gospels. Yeah, you know, <laughs> man, God is so good. And 
And uh, what what do you have any new directions, you guys? And you you, you made the secret announcement about church history. You know, you yeah. heard it here first on the Art of Catholic. Yeah, you heard it here. Yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> But I mean, what, what's your what's your plan for the future? You, you... we're probably going to start allowing and having more students. Um, we're going to do another enrollment here soon, and probably another enrollment. How many people are a part of it at present? We're about eighteen hundred. That's awesome. And we could go a lot faster. I mean, the, the difficult thing is always the technology, right? Um, the technical side of it, the support, the web design, the web development, um, user interface. These are all things that. I didn't know a lot about when it started, and I know a lot about it now. I mean, that's, I, I mean, I spend half my time reading St. Thomas Aquinas and writing notes for the next video, and half my time on the phone with, you know, web developers all over the world trying to, you know, find solutions and fix problems and, and things like that. Right. So I think now that I, this year, really, we've, we've gotten really tight with our, our web development team and, and some things that we want to do. And so I feel a lot more secure now to grow it and to also produce more content. So I think throughout the rest of 15, but especially in 16, I think we'll see a lot of growth. That's um, great. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, man, it's a, it's a great service to the church because the more formed we are, obviously the better Catholics we are. And as Paul VI said back at the beginning of the new evangelization, you know, you've got to be a public witness. And the only way that we can be public witnesses and really affect the world around us is if we are first evangelized. That's and, right. And this is a huge tool in the, event, in the new evangelization. Right. And a lot of people, they want, you know, the young mother or the guy who's a, a dentist is not going to go buy the five-volume Summa, no. St. Thomas Aquinas, and just right. start ripping it off the bone and just getting into it. <laughs> it's not likely, you know? But if they join something like the New St. Thomas Institute, they join and they start taking classes. They start learning the attributes of God. They learn. We teach them how to read an article of the Summa. Most people don't know how to do that. But once you learn to do that, you are now equipped to really get deep in Thomas Aquinas. So we we train you how to do it. It only takes eight minutes. You know, you give us eight minutes. We will show you exactly how to read the Summa so you can read Thomas Aquinas. Um, And other tools, too, like Bible searches. We now have all that integrated in the NSTI. So you can look up the Latin. You can look up the... It's kind of like Verbum, you yeah. know, or Logos, Bible yeah. software. We now have that integrated into NSTI. So if you're a member, you can do Bible searches. You can search the encyclo- Catholic Encyclopedia. You can search um, councils, papal encyclicals, all that kind of stuff right in there. So it really just kind of guides people. It's not as hard as a lot of people think, but it guides them and holds their hand and gets them started and then really introduces them with more and more deep stuff. It is amazing how far you've come in the few years that I've known you because you were starting to write your first books back when uh, we first met, and yeah. uh, you're publishing those. And I, you know, I don't know how you find the time to do all the things that you do. I God heard, multiplies time; He does. If you if, if you honor Him, you have to pray. Yeah, and you have to pray. Um, he does multiply time. I remember, you know, being in the PhD program back then. I think we had six kids. Um, I was working a full-time job to support them and doing the doctoral work. And I would hang out with, like, the single male PhD <laughs> students. They're, like, yeah. 26. Like, I'm so stressed out. You know, and I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have the time to do anything. And I, I would just hold my, yeah, hold right. my breath because, like, What's they're the not going to get it. Yeah, you know, they're not going to get it. No. But I think if you are deep in mental prayer, for, for somehow God shows you what's more. There's never enough time to do everything, but he shows you those, like, small game changer things that you do and somehow that creates more time. I don't I don't really fully understand it. Yeah. But somehow you just get a lot of stuff done when you're tapped into him and letting him guide you because it's it's more like it's like the 80/20 principle. You ever heard of this? Mm-hmm. What's it called? Like Parati's principle or Parati's just heard of this 80/20. I don't. Know. Yeah, but it's it's basically most of your output or your reward or your success in life is based on 20% of your effort, not the 80%, right? And sometimes it's even more like 90, 10. And I think when we pray and when we have a relationship with Jesus, I think he's always kind of pushing us to those effective 20%. And and I think it starts, you know, the prayer life obviously is, is gigantic. I mean, that's what I write my books about, and that's what I'm totally into. But it's also honoring the Sabbath day. You know, if you honor our Lord and you give the mm-hmm. time back to him and you're not doing the stuff that 
you know, you necessarily want to do. Because it's not weekend's not just about chilling out on Sundays and watching football games. It's it's resting in the Lord. Yeah, and it's sanctified. Yeah, and I, I remember uh, when I was in graduate school here, and I was in Dr. Hahn's class, and he challenged us. And I was on a scholarship. You know, I had a four zero. I had to maintain that average, and I didn't have a lot of money at the time, and I still don't have a lot of money. But I I remember he really. He really challenged us to not study at all on Sundays because our vocation at this point in time, we were students, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so I I struggle with that a little bit because I'm I'm a little bit of a workaholic, and but I made the decision I'm going to do it because you know Scott said, "Well, Lord will honor that," and you know what He did, and I started to enjoy my Sundays and be rested because God knows what we need, right? He made us, and so He knows that we need this rest, and some of us have to be forced to take this rest. And when I did it. All the other things I did in the other six days multiplied. And then when I took the prayer life and I added yep. to that, yep. boom. Well, see, when we're tired, we're both parents, right? How old's your oldest now, Matt? 13. Thir- mine's 13 too. Okay. When you're tired, you do stupid stuff. That's for sure. You say stupid stuff to your wife. No patience. You say stupid stuff to your kids. You say stupid stuff at work. You get yourself in trouble when you're tired. So really one of the best things that you can do for yourself as a human person, whether you're a Catholic or a Christian whatever, is be rested. And that's why God said, take one and seven, you know, for us Catholics, it's Sunday. Please rest. Please take a nap. It's better for you. I know that when I don't get rest or when I'm tired, you know, I'm at this conference right now, it's five days. When I get home, I'm going to be tired. Right. And I, I know this. I'm worried about it because I'm going to be grumpy. And I start getting into this, like, this cycle in my head. I talk to my spiritual director. It's like this, this cyclone. And I get a negative thought, and it just goes round and round and round, and it just goes deeper and deeper. It's like a, a stake in the ground. Every time you think about it, it's like a hammer hitting on the top, driving it deeper and deeper into the ground. And the more tired I get, the more I get into this loop. My wife and I call it my loop, you know? <laughs> I'm being vulnerable and showing my oh, inner yeah. psychology, you right? Are. And I get into the loop. And, and sometimes when you're in the loop, like, you can't fall asleep. Right. So it's now like 1 a.m. So now what? Now you're even more tired. And it's like this vicious cycle. And so if we live our lives the way God designed it, where we rest at night and we keep Sundays, because I'm, you know, I'm a naturally a busy person. Like I just fall into that yeah, me too. format, you know? And the temptation is, is just to burn yourself out. And so my wife and I have just set up guards, you know, like when I come home at, from work in the evenings, it's off. Don't go to the laptop and check for that email. You, I am home with the family. Like, it's a switch. I had a priest recently tell me, he was like, yeah, I'm telling men now, it's not very politically correct, but go to a bar and have a beer before you go home. Just like, <laughs> like you've got to somehow get off of work because now with like iPhones and iPads and computers, it's like constant, you're never man. off of work. Never. You know, your boss is like emailing you at 7 p.m. and expects you to check it. That's ridiculous. We We need to have space. And same with the weekends, you know. You've got to block that out for your family, especially the Sunday. Oh, man. And uh, I think that, you know, Mike Aquilina is my spiritual director. And I'm really blessed in that. And one of the first things he always says to me after, uh, you know, if I'm talking to him, I'm like, man, Mike, I I just, I'm overwhelmed. I can't, I'm working on this video project, writing this book. I got to go give this talk. And he's, the first thing he always asks me is, how much sleep are you getting? Yep. Every stinking night. He's like, you know, this is what you got to do. And if you don't, when the when the physical side falls apart, as you said, the, the spiritual side falls apart. It so does. And for and for I think for parents listening, well, I can only I don't I'm sure it's true for priests and everybody, but as a parent, my wife and I both experience it. Right. I would I would probably say I probably didn't notice it in the first five years of marriage. We've been married 14 years now. We have we're having our eighth baby. I would pretty much say every fight that we've ever had or disagreement is when we're tired. You know, yeah, I, and I, I only start, we only started realizing this about four years ago. We were talking to a priest. We had just had a baby and we were kind of grumpy and we were talking to him and he says, well, wh- well, how long ago was the baby born? And we said, oh, four months. He goes, oh yeah. He's like every, every single one of the person I tell him in the first five months, you're going to be tired because you're doing nursing and you're up and changing and all that. And your hours are all off. And that's when our couples always fight. He's like, that's how it is all across the parish. And we were like, oh, yeah, that does make sense. We're not sleeping so well. Maybe that's why we're not agreeing on these issues, whether it be finances or where the kids are going to play baseball. I mean, whatever. It's stupid stuff. Right. You disagree with that stuff because you're tired. 
And, and, and you don't eat well. That's another thing. You got to eat well. Yeah. And, and I think that part of it, too, is I got, I know for a while I got so gung-ho in my prayer life and my spiritual life, I started to neglect the responsibilities that I had. And I got too caught up in, no, I got to get through these things. I got to, you know, mm-hmm. say my rosary. I've got to do my morning readings. I got, you know, all that stuff. And it got to the point where I had to finally say, you know what? I might not be able to do as much prayer today. I know my wife is exhausted. Yep. And I'm going to go take the baby so she can go back to bed. Yeah, that's and it. it I was the to. same way. I, mean, I remember being really into the liturgy of the hours. Yep. Brief, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to be hardcore. I'm going to do it in Latin. Okay. And then I'm going to do the old one. <laughs> and then I read, you know, like the Benedictines used to wake up in the middle of the night to do matins. <laughs> so I started doing that. I That's was like crazy, 2 man. or 3 a.m. I'd wake up. My <laughs> alarm would go off. I would get out of bed and I'd pray matins like you know, as a zombie yeah. and then go back to bed. Well, after like six months of that, my wife was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, and, the, and what was wrong with me was I was just I was waking up every night. I wasn't getting like good sleep. And that's not, you know, I saw she taught me. And my spiritual director taught me that is not my identity and vocation. Exactly. It's really cool that St. Benedict did that. Right. But I'm not a Benedictine. I'm not a monk. I'm a man who's a father and a husband living in the 2000s. Yeah, it, it, you, you cannot live according to the no. rules of someone else's vocation. That's right. And that's okay. It's good. It's the only way we're going to grow in holiness. That's right. That's right. I want to back up for a second to uh, your conversion because I'm I'm guessing that uh, at some point someone who is kind of maybe on their way into Catholicism and they're kind of listening to us talk about all this stuff and they're searching out and whatnot. And you've been Catholic now for how many years? Came in in 06, so nine years. Okay. Yeah, I'm coming yeah, up Just on, over nine. I came in in 98. Okay. What, what, what would you say? Uh, what would you say to someone who's kind of on the fence and just kind of wondering about this whole thing and should I do it or not? I'm going to guess that the person who's on the fence and exploring it, for most people, once they start pursuing the intellectual side of it, the doctrine side, and they're right. listening to a program like this, right. right? They're already pretty far advanced. What's What's usually holding them back is the fear. I was extremely afraid. I was afraid of, of what my family would say, what my wife's family would say, what my parishioners would say. I was afraid of things like finances, and my wife was pregnant. What I've learned from my own conversion and talking to literally hundreds of other men and women who've converted, many of which were ministers in the Protestant tradition, don't be afraid. You would be so amazed. Well, if you watch Journey Home, you can see part of it. But you'd be so amazed at the miraculous things that Jesus Christ does to help bring you into the church. That's right. I'm talking about things like health and finances and family. And I mean, people in your family, probably the people you think that would never become a Catholic, they might be the very, they might convert. I mean, you never know the kind of things that Christ is going to do. He's a good shepherd. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He's going to prosper you spiritually and just Follow him and trust him. It will not be as hard as you imagine. It'll be very joyful. Now, that being said, once you are a Catholic, it, it is kind of hard, right, Matt? Yeah, it is. There's struggles, man. Sure. I struggle. Some years are great. Some years aren't. You know, you have seasons, just as you have seasons in your career and seasons in your marriage. You have seasons as a Catholic. And there are times when I think, man, I became a Catholic, you know? <laughs> but that's kind of like crazy times when I'm tired, you know? <laughs> It all goes together. Right. And you, and you run into people, too, that uh, I, I think one of the biggest things that keeps people lots of times from becoming Catholic is, that, you know, another Catholic. And mm-hmm. they're like, oh, well, that person, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, look, man, if, if I if I was going to not be something because I didn't like the way someone else was living, I right. would have quit being a Protestant a long time yeah, ago. You would have quit being an American. Right. Quit being anything. Exactly. Yeah, you know the the church is is a divine institution that's being run by fallen humans, and and so people are going to make mistakes just yep. like we do on a daily basis, yep. and you don't want to ever throw the baby out with the bathwater because right. this is the church given to us by Jesus Christ. That's right, and and there's nothing more beautiful in the world. The longer I'm, I, it's kind of this. The longer I'm Catholic, the more and more I realize that the personal connection with Jesus is primary. 
it's almost like I, I kind of had that as a Protestant and then became Catholic and I was pumped about the, you know, cardinals and bishops and USCCB document and, you know, my local diocese and this religious order and, you know, all these things that I was really got really excited about because I didn't have those before. Right. Encyclicals. And those are all awesome things and they're gifts from Jesus Christ. But if you get really into that and Jen Fuller and I were just talking about this. For people who make their primary identity, not just not Catholic, but like Catholic ish, like all the Catholic stuff, you know, like the Catholic politics and the Catholic, I guess you could call it gossip and the trappings. Yeah, yeah, all the trappings. I found myself getting kind of bitter. You know, you you look at things and you get have your disappointments and why did that cardinal say that or, mm-hmm. you know, why did this happen or why did my bishop get moved or why did this priest get moved and start having all these and you can lose your focus. And so I'm still kind of a new Catholic. I've been Catholic. what did I say? Nine years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of going back to this idea of, you know, it's all about Jesus in the Eucharist. I can go make a visit. I can be with him in the mass and I can know our lady in the rosary and like a more simple Catholicism. And I honestly don't want to, you know, watch a Michael Voris video. You know, I don't <laughs> want to read a lot of Catholic periodicals and I've really scaled back on Catholic blogs. I'm a Catholic blogger, but still, I mean, like I've scaled out of that because you kind of can get into, caught into this whirlwind and I think it can spoil your face. I think that there's a lot of trappings there, like you said, and the devil can get into those details. That's exactly right. So I would, I would caution converts and people coming in it's great to get oriented and learn all about the structure of the church and the institution of the church and what's going on in the church. But we have to take our eyes off this earthly horizon and look up, you know, raise it up. And then you see Jesus and Mary and Joseph and John the Baptist and Peter and Paul and all the saints in the celestial court. And you realize that's where everything's really happening. And you experience that most in the mass, right? That's where you, that's what's really happening in the Catholic church, that reality, not what Cardinal so-and-so said, or what they're going to say at the Synod of marriage and all that other, or how someone's going to twist the Pope's words. And, exactly. You know, yeah. Right. And, and I think that the thing that really struck me and continues to strike me, the longer that I'm Catholic is we had this whole personal relationship with the Lord. Like that was our vernacular. Do you know Jesus? Yes. You know? But the the personal relationship that we have as a Catholic is on a different plane in mm-hmm. the sense that it's a familial relationship. Yeah. And I think that the entire motif of Catholicism is family life. Yeah. And and just like, you know, God is father, Jesus is brother, Mary is our mother, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and, and Jesus lived in a family. Just like in our human families, you got problems, you got issues. You got crazy uncles. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And you, you've got that one sister-in-law doesn't get along with, you know, whoever, you know right. I mean? All that kind of stuff. And yeah. It's like at Thanksgiving, if you focus on that, it ruins your Thanksgiving dinner. Right. Instead, you should be like, wow, who did the yams? These are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> you know? Right? The, the yam of God. Yeah, yeah the yams. You know, like <laughs> that's whatever it is. Sorry, God. <laughs> but, yeah, that's a great analogy. You know, we're in a family and there are crazy people. But if you focus on the mom and the dad and the older brother, Jesus, right, and, and those siblings who are perfect— the saints, you know, they're, they're in heaven now. But the, and the flip side of that is, is totally true. It's not just a negative thing. I remember when I was coming to the church here at Franciscan, after I received our Lord, and I'd been on this several-year journey into the church, and I looked up because I was one of the, I was like the first one at the Mass to receive our Lord because mm-hmm. my, my sponsor says I elbowed him out of the way so I nice. could be first, right? Nice. Yeah. So I, I, here I am encountering God. I, I receive our Lord. I go back to my seat, and I'm thanking God for all the graces he'd given me to become Catholic. Everything he'd done. And my fam- some of my family members were there. And, you know, the- as the liturgy went on, man, the gap got bigger and bigger mm. and bigger between us. I could just feel it, yeah. this chasm. But it also occurred to me as I turned and I was watching these several thousand people file by me that I had been incorporated into this family through the sacraments. And now these were really my brothers and sisters, not in a way that got rid of my blood relations, but in a way that superseded my blood relations, because now I'm part of the family of God through the mystical body of Christ. So I'm going to take not just their negatives, and I'm just going to see the bad stuff they do. And these are my brothers and sisters, right? Yes. We love our brothers and sisters, That's and right. we can't wait to see them and commune with them 
have a meal with them, you know, yeah. go through the things in life with them. This is the greatest support structure in the world. The Catholic right. Church is, is our family. That's right. That's so, right. Man, it, it's just a, and there's crazy people in it. There are. There's a lot, a lot of crazy. Sometimes people. it's me, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but that's just how it is. I was I was recently in Rome. I was at the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, and we were in um, Cardinal or Archbishop Denoya was talking about then Cardinal Ratzinger, and they're saying, you know, maybe in these documents when there's heresies, you know, in the world, we shouldn't call out the person by name. Kind of, it's embarrassing, you know. It's not ecumenically correct. You know, maybe we should just call out the teaching and not address the person. And Cardinal Ratzinger's response was amazing. He said, no, we should address the person because they're part of the church. They're part of our family. Right. So it's not enough just, it's like if you were at a, you know, a big family gathering, you're like, you know, someone has been, you know, stealing the pies, and, you know, you know, like, <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, Uncle Larry, we love you. Why are you stealing the pies, man? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Like, there is this idea that there is, even people who are in heresy or who are dividing the church, there is this idea that they that they are part of what we are. And yes, they can be disciplined, and there's a lot of things that could happen canonically to them, but they they, they do deserve being addressed by name. Yeah, because, again, it's a family. It's a family. Yeah. Wow. Well, listen, man, I want to thank you for, uh, this is great. for coming on the Art of This is Catholic. great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross— Cross uh, publish this over on my podcast. So I want to I want to talk to you. I want people who are listening on on my show to learn about your show. Where can they find it? It's uh, the Art of Catholic. With Art of Matthew Catholic. Leonard. Yeah, uh, it's up on iTunes. Good. And and uh, what's where can they find the site? Where can they learn more about you? MatthewSLeonard.com. S as in S as in Solomon. All right. <laughs> yeah. So Matthew S as in Solomon. Matthew S Leonard. Dot com. That's right. And I got a And do you put your podcast up there too? I do. It's up there Good. and, and uh, I blog on a weekly basis as well. Good. And do you have like an email newsletter people can sign up? Uh yes. Good. In fact I, I throw up a uh, a talk up there. You want to sign up, you get a free talk, you do the ebook. I've Good. got a, a free talk. What's the talk? How, it's called uh, Writing Straight with Crooked Lines, How God Saves You Even When You've Been Really Bad. Ooh, and so I, I want to hear that. It's it's really just about the, the metaphysical reality of the cross. Why is it that Jesus dying on a cross actually saves us and gets to heaven? Yeah. That's what it's all about. So if they go to MatthewSLeonard.com and get that. Right. They can download that. You got it. Cool, and they get the podcast and all that. That's exactly What about books? Right. Books, man. Um, I've written a couple so far. So i got one called Louder Than Words, The Art of Living yep. as a Catholic. I've read that one. It's good. I've got another one called Prayer Works. Uh, getting a grip on Catholic spirituality, kind of go through the three stages of the spiritual life. I, I, I throw a ton of uh, Gergou Lagrange in there. You know, love love me some Gergou Lagrange. <laughs> who doesn't, man? Yep. Everybody name? listening, find out who Father Gergou Lagrange is. <laughs> He's the and man. get into. It. If you're in, in New St. Thomas Institute, I talk about him. Oh, you have often. to. Yeah. But if you're not, if you never heard of him, actually get Matt's book. There yeah. you go. It's a great yeah. introduction. There you go. It's you'll a great get, introduction you'll get to that thought. Of Gergou Lagrange. Good. And uh, and then the next the next project. Well, just so- Gary Lagrange was, in my opinion, the greatest Thomist of the last century. He also oversaw John Paul II's That's right. doctoral dissertation. That's the whole reason he went there, right? He I went know. to study. Under. So Gary Lagrange is the man. He's a Dominican priest, Thomistic theologian. Absolutely, I mean, my my doctoral dissertation has Gary Lagrange footnotes in it. Yeah, how can it not? Love, love Gary Lagrange. Yeah, okay. no, I, I used him a lot. Um, so the and right now I'm finishing up for the St. Paul Center. I'm the executive director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, which was started by Scott Hahn. Yes. Right? So we're here in Steubenville. So right now I'm working on this uh, Journey Through Scripture project, which is a parish-based Bible study program that I've been flying around the country and teaching in addition to my own talks for sheesh, eight years now, I think. Mm-hmm. So we're taking those and we're migrating them to video, like high, yeah, high look, depth. Yeah, they look good. Yeah, pretty video. And uh, they're going to be up on the uh, streaming platform uh, with – symbol on and Catholicism by Father Barron and that kind of stuff. Yep. So that's coming in uh, about end of August 2015, somewhere around there. Super. You know, keep that in your prayers. But the the uh, the next thing then is to, I, I've been a Catholic for 15 years now. I'm finally getting around to writing my conversion story. Good. So that, Good. That's, that's been a long time coming. I've, I've People always ask me if I'm going to do it, and I always kind of feel like I need to be Catholic longer <laughs> before I, you know what I mean? It's you funny. Gotta let it, you you got to let it distill. Yeah, right. Because I still feel like, even this many years into it, I still feel like I'm kind of pulling up the weeds mm-hmm. of my Protestantism. I, I just, yep. it, it takes a long time to develop a Catholic worldview. 
Exactly. And uh, how, how long was it between Scott Hahn's conversion and when they published Rome's We Don't? Do you know? I, you know, I don't know. I think the, he came into the church in 86. And the book came out what? I don't, I 90s, don't remember. Gotta right? Be, gotta be early 90s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but he's so hardcore. I mean, he just went, you know, he just went at it. Yeah. But it, you know, I'm not nearly as smart as Scott Hahn, so I had to wait a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that's going to come out through Lighthouse Catholic Media. Cool. In Emmaus Road. That's great. Publishing. And yeah. when, when will we see that? Oh, man. Taylor, depends on how much sleep I get. Yeah, exactly. Um, my guess is it'll publish uh, early next year. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Great. But yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff well, going on, man. Well, good. It's been, so so they, they get the podcast at iTunes. Yep. MatthewSLeonard.com. Yep. Podcast Dear is folks, the they, I'm giving a free book. I think I mentioned it, right? Yep. Thomas you did. Aquinas, 50 pages. If you want to get into Thomas Aquinas, it's free. TaylorMarshall.com. Right. And um, and then you can get my podcast there. It's called the Taylor Marshall Catholic Show. It's on iTunes. Yep. Um, it's also at TaylorMarshall.com. And then New St. Thomas Institute is NewStThomas.com. Yeah. Great stuff. So, well, thank you very much for. Uh, yeah, this has been. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd love to get together. And, yeah, we and should do it again. again. Absolutely. God All right. Bless. Godspeed. God bless you, Taylor. All right. Bye. See you. Thanks so much for joining me on The Art of Catholic. Don't forget to please leave the show a rating on iTunes. It would mean a lot to me and possibly to others as well. God bless you. All right, there it is. Thanks for listening. I think you can see that Matthew Leonard's a great guy. And if you're looking for other podcasts to listen to, I'd I'd really encourage you to check out his new podcast, The Art of Catholic. Also, if you're new to the world of podcasts, you need to head over to iTunes. And the way you do is you go into the iTunes store and you can search for podcasts. And the way searching for podcasts work is those podcasts that are downloaded the most and those that have the most ratings and positive ratings are the ones that are featured and shared uh, to people who are looking for podcasts. But unfortunately, the iTunes interface for podcasts in the iTunes store is not that great. And that's why you hear podcasters like myself and Matthew asking the listeners to go in and rate the podcast because when you rate the podcast, it helps people find the podcast. It updates it in the algorithm. So I would encourage you, if you enjoy this podcast, it would mean the world to me if you'd go into iTunes and then go into iTunes Store and search Taylor Marshall Show or Taylor Marshall Catholic Show. And mine will bump up right there. And if you would, leave a comment. I read all of these comments every week. You leave a review, one star to five star. Please just leave a review, whatever you think it's worth. And I will give you a shout out on the show. And since last week, we had a few people leave um, reviews. So I'm going to give a, a shout out here to Tom Z. Tom Z writes, here's my honest opinion after listening to your podcast. If all Catholics were like you, thought like you, love Jesus like you, and reason like you, I believe many Catholic-turned-Protestant people would leave their current churches and joyfully return home to the Catholic Church. The battle rages on with it. Well, Tom, thanks for saying that, and I think all of us are called to have joy, to be salt, to be light, and the purpose of this podcast really is just to encourage people to have faith in Christ and to live a life that's worthy of the name of Christian. And when we do that, we have joy, we have peace, and people are attracted to that. We live in a world where people are dying, literally dying for hope. And we have a monopoly on it. So let's share it with other people. Also, a shout-out goes to In Metz, who left a five-star review, and, and she wrote, These podcasts are great, very informative, in a manner that is easy to understand, Dr. Marshall is not only well-versed in theology, but he also has a wonderful way of working in practical applications for your life, end quote. Thank you very much for that. And yes, we must have faith and works. We have doctrine. We put doctrine into our minds and then into our hearts, and hopefully it spills out into our works, our actions, our deeds. As we learned in last week's podcast on the book of Revelation, The mark of the beast is placed on the forehead and on the right hand. This goes back to Deuteronomy and other places in the Old Testament where the law of God is supposed to be placed on the forehead and upon the hand. In the forehead, it signifies the faith in our minds, our faith that we consent to. And then the faith on our right hand, sorry left-handed people, 
signifies that we do deeds. Our faith is in our actions. It's in our hands. We have to always have faith and works. And this is one reason why at the New St. Thomas Institute, we not only teach theology every single week, but we also give a portion of the tuition to help orphans in China and also to feed thousands of people every month um, by providing meals. So again, it's faith and works. It's not just building our brains and swelling our brains of knowledge. It must flow out into the lives of other people. People. Also, shout out goes to Rick, Catholic Christian. He wrote a comment on the Feast of the Assumption, August 15th. And Rick writes, Taylor Marshall's podcast is something that every Christian needs to hear. He presents the riches of the church's teaching in a concise format that is both practical and edifying. I am grateful that the Holy Spirit is using Dr. Marshall as an instrument to promulgate true Catholic dogma that is faithful to Scripture, tradition, and magisterium. I particularly enjoyed podcast number 84, in which he discusses the Blessed Virgin Mary's multifaceted role as daughter and queen of Israel and mother of the church. I highly recommend this podcast for those who love the super glorious things of Christ the Lord. Thanks so much, Rick. Really appreciate you. And I agree, we must be faithful to scripture, tradition, and magisterium. That's the three-legged stool upon which we must all Sit. If you're missing one of those legs, scripture, tradition, or the magisterium, the stool that you're sitting on is going to fall over. And then lastly, a shout out to Stoshi, who left a five-star review and wrote, Thanks, Dr. Marshall, for the great insight. Every week I eagerly await your new podcast. I'm a confirmation teacher, and your talks have been most valuable. Stoshi, thanks for being a confirmation teacher. I love to, to see in the comments here everyone who's you know teaching RCIA, deacons, even priests, religious, and those who are teaching uh, CCD classes and confirmation classes like Stoshi. Keep up the great work. You are literally the ambassadors of Christ to this world. And remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Hey, a final reminder, New St. Thomas Institute Back to School Fall Enrollment opened this week. If you want to join, this is the week to do it. Check it out, NewStThomas.com, NewStThomas.com. Till next time, peace. This podcast was brought to you by the New St. Thomas Institute. Discover online Catholic classes and earn your certificate in Catholic theology at the New St. Thomas Institute. To register for online Catholic classes, please visit newstthomas.com. That's newstthomas.com.